All right, we are going to continue with our media availabilities today for the 25th anniversary of the Food City 500 at Bristol Motor Speedway. We are joined by Jimmy Johnson, the driver of the number 48 Lowe's Chevrolet, um, our seven-time Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series champion, and also our most recent uh, race winner uh, for his 81st win, which puts him two wins away from Cale Yarborough in sixth place all time on the wins list. And one of those 81 wins did come here at Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, Jimmy, why don't you just start off by talking to us about your thoughts uh, returning here to the last great Coliseum. I'm excited to come back. I mean, this is one of our uh, you know, most entertaining tracks on the circuit. Um, clearly, things have changed a lot here over the years with the resurfacing and then the VHT on the bottom. So um, I, I show up with great optimism. Um, I feel like we necessarily, don't necessarily qualify great here, but I always race much better. And uh, we've been in that top three, top five uh, finishing position quite a few times. Uh, maybe a few looks at a win with a very competitive car and just hopeful to kind of raise it up a notch, um, use the momentum from last, I guess, two weeks ago from the win in Texas and uh, find just a little bit more speed here and, and go to victory lane once again. All right. We will open up to questions. We'll start over here with Jerry and then go to Claire. Over here, Jimmy. Jim, Jerry Jordan, kickingthetires.net and PRN. Um, First off, are you okay after Texas? And in the off week, Del Jr. was trash talking and said you got a pink zero for not working out. And uh, he did like 60 miles on his bike. Yeah, you know, the three IV bags did wonders. And after leaving the media center, and thank you all for sticking around, um, I started my off weekend quickly that night and proceeded to uh, uh, chase, chase out the pain with as many margaritas and beers as I could down in Mexico. So. I recovered well, unfortunately came back sick from Mexico, and I'm just on the tail end of that now. So um, if you're going to play, you're going to pay, I guess, at the end of the day. <laughs> but uh, I just, just started catching wind of, of his uh, harassment, and I'm, I'm waiting for my moment to strike back. <laughs> we'll go to Claire, Bob, and then Dustin. Claire B. Lang, Sirius X, NASCAR Radio. That was very good, by the way. Um, you know, I'm wondering about the changing conditions on this track and how much you know, you who are used to breaking a track down and, you know, kind of like to analyze it, who did so good at Texas, uh, can figure this track out and what you know for sure and what you don't know right now on the surface. I think we're all looking for a variable condition here just to change it up because we know the top is the place to be. Um, for me personally, this track, it's been one of the more difficult tracks for me to figure out. So um, I welcome any change that might be thrown at us and, and any opportunity to create uh, different lanes and searching around the racetrack. So for me, I find it more as an opportunity for guys that run here, you know, consistently up front every year. Uh, maybe they're not as excited as, as somebody in my shoes. Go to Bob and Dustin. <clears throat> Bob Hocker, ESPN. Uh, was the off week any different considering that you won? I mean, if you had lo if you had not won and not had a win yet, would, would you have felt any different? Damn straight. Uh, <laughs> would have been drowning sorrows versus celebrating and enjoying it. So uh, there's there's no better way to go into an off weekend than with a win or, you know, a strong run, strong performance because, you know, we all sit inside of our heads and, uh, and think about where we're at, what's going on. Um, you know, a, a tricky start to our season, to say the least, and to, uh, you know, to punch our ticket to the chase and get that win uh, made for a great, uh, great off weekend. We'll go to Dustin, Tucker, and then Mark. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. Um, obviously, with with what's put down on the lower surface, it's a great, create grip to, to help you guys. But uh, but you know, last fall, uh, the bottom lane was you were penalized on restarts. I mean, you, nobody could really take advantage. You know, really, they'd lose several spots or lose spots. I think you even lost some at the, at, at the end. So, if this is being put down, what more can be done to even out the lanes, or should that even be the goal? Should there always be one lane that's better, in particular, on, on restarts? It's really tough for any track to uh, to address just a restart problem. Um, you know, I think without the VHT down, there's there's no chance. Um, during the course of a 500 lap race, I think our issue is that we, we literally just run it off and use it up. So at the start of a race, I think the, the advantage is probably, um, you know, the, the lanes are more equal, but at the end of the race, there's really not much you can do for that. Um, I think in Dreamland, some of us drivers have, have considered like some kind of grip strips that might exist if you could use a painted line. I mean, we see a painted line in Atlanta offer a ton of grip on the inside of the lane and inside of the tracks. If there was a way to create something like that, um, I commend Bristol for trying, you know, in that wishland space to, to try to do something here at the bottom. 
Martinsville looked at it for the outside lane. It was hard to tell if it if it was worth the uh, you know worth the risk to try it. Uh, but here it's worked, and in the drivers' council meeting, you know, after our fall race here, we were all eager to make sure it was was back down and thought that it did offer more options, uh, more options than without it. We'll go to Tucker and then Mark Allen Woody. Uh, Tucker White, SpeedwayMedia.com. Uh, Jimmy, you kind of answered this with the uh, last question, but given that we're using the VHT to make the bottom line the preferred groove around here again, wouldn't it make more sense to just dig up the pro the progressive banking here and just restore it to its original 36-degree banking like we used to back, back in the early 2000s? I think Bruton's question is going to be, would you mind paying for it? <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than doing that. So <laughs> I think that's, that's the bottom line. We'll go over to the far right to Mark and then Al and Woody. Mark Arrow, PRN. Hey. There you are. Uh, good, good morning. morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, we saw at Richmond last year bump and run to win the race, and it was something that used to be fairly common. It happened here, you know, Jeff Gordon, you know, doinked Rusty Wallace a couple of times to win the race. Uh, wasn't it considered a big deal? Last year, you know, it, was a, it, it seemed to be a bigger deal than I, at least I thought it needed to be. Um, when did the, do you feel like there's been a difference of, of the way you are allowed to do that or, you know, what has happened over the years to where that has become at least a misdemeanor, if not a, a felony charge to bump somebody uh, to win a race? Yeah, I, I see where you're going with it and I, I do agree. I mean, we're definitely, um, there's less grudges kind of amongst drivers in today's era, um, right or wrong, it's just, just how it is. But I, I think the majority of of uh, the reaction was because it was amongst teammates. Um, and I guess back in the Gordon Wallace era, the, the teammates you had on a given team were, were less. And, and Rusty against Jeff, they weren't on the same team, so it was a lot easier to, to just chalk it up as good racing. But you know, we're, we're all a bit more sensitive to it now, especially inside the cars. Um, I'm sure the old fans are a little frustrated with it, and I guess maybe the new fans are. But uh, it's just kind of the evolution of this generation of driver. Um, I would say more than anything. And then the teammate piece. Would you, be would you be willing to do the same thing if you were in, in Carl Edwards' position? I want to say yes, but I'm so bad with the bump and run. It's, it's a bump and crash. Um, and I, I've found that it, for me personally, it takes more time to set up a soft nudge to move someone than it is just to pass them. And that's just been my style over the years. Um, I, I'm terrible at it. I mean, I've, uh, I tried to move Rich Bickle out of the way and 99 or something at uh, Memphis and I picked his rear tires up and carried him down the straightaway and set him down in time to crash head on into the wall and turn one and I uh, never knew that I picked his tires up off the ground felt terrible and then unfortunately when I was shopping the next day uh, for groceries I saw him in the produce section I thought that man was going to beat me to death with a head of lettuce and chase me around in the produce section so at that point I figured I better just worry about passing people instead of trying to move them I go to Al and then Woody and Chris. Hi, Jimmy. Al Pearson, Auto Week. Uh, I'm, I'm asking a, a, a number of drivers the same question, so the rest of you guys can bear with me. At Daytona Beach in, in February, Junior told us it would take him a while to get really comfortable in a race like he used to. He said the other drivers will see it before the fans and you guys do. Is he back? Is he doing things now? Like he's like he was never gone. Yeah, things that we don't notice that y'all do. No, he's he's right with that. Um, you know, it is uh, when when you miss that much time from the car, um, the sport changes. The feeling, your sensitivity to uh, what you feel in the race car, kind of fades. And and to be as sharp as you need to to find, you know, five hundredths of a second to be competitive, it's tough and it takes reps. So I, I see where he's coming from and why he made that comment in February. And uh, I can't say that I've, it's crossed my mind watching him this year. He seems very comfortable and in there. But to, uh, to go to Texas two weeks ago and for him to run as competitive as he did at a treacherous track, I mean, your sensitivity to the car and, and sliding the tires needed to be as sharp as ever. I think that's a great indication of uh, him, him finding that last little bit. And uh, he's ready to go to victory lane. What he came with MRN, Jimmy, another short track next week in Richmond, and now you've got day and night racing there. A lot of the tracks are very temperature sensitive. How about Richmond? Do you notice much of a difference between day and night racing there? Yeah, I've always been a huge fan of day races there, and I think our, uh, 
we've won a bunch of the rainouts on, you know, I guess it would be a Sunday day race. And we always joke internally on the 48, if it rains out, like, sweet, we've got a shot. You know, so I think a day race there puts on a much better show. I'm happy to hear that Charlotte's going to do a day race for the October race. Um, I just think we put on better races. You know, when the sun sets, the, uh, the grip goes up, and it just makes it easier. You know, not, not that it's easy to do our jobs, but you have the best drivers and the best teams in the world, and you make the conditions a step easier. Um, you, we aren't going to have as competitive racing. So I'm excited to see Richmond go to a day race. We'll go to Chris and then Kelly. Chris Knight, CatchFence.com. Jimmy, I was curious with yesterday's announcement that Charlotte's fall race is moving from a night race to a day race. The track said that the drivers had a, a, a say in that, and I was just wondering if you were contacted by the track, and what did you think of the change? Yeah, the conversation came up in the driver council meeting, and uh, through us talking to our, our fellow drivers in the garage area and reporting back, that was something we were, were adamant about to, uh, to put on a better show for uh, that fall October race. Go to Kelly and then Tyler. Kelly Crandall, racer.com. Jimmy, it seemed like in Martinsville, something that stood out was the patience level from lap one was kind of gone instead of almost slowly developing over the course of a 500 mile race. Would you attribute that now to, to stage racing and how important all of you guys are figuring out these points are and stage wins are? And do you expect more of the same here this weekend? Uh, you're 100% right. The, uh, the stage racing has changed the flow of a race for sure. And I think drivers like myself, uh, maybe Kenseth, um, I don't know, there's, there's some guys that maybe don't qualify as well that always show up at the front when the, when the checkered falls. It's messing with that flow, for sure. Um, short track racing, is uh, it, it will definitely heighten it, and I think you'll see more of it here because we can lean on one another. Same thing at Martinsville. Um, but I, I definitely agree. Stage racing has changed the game, and uh, I don't see it uh, calming down. It's going to continue to ramp up. I'll go to Tyler, then Lee. Hey, Jimmy, Tyler Painter, RacewayInsider.com over here. Um, so you mentioned that you had a good time on your off weekend, which I'm, I'm sure you, you definitely enjoyed that. But do you find yourself having to prepare any differently for a race at Bristol than any other tracks on the circuit? No, I mean, I, you know, I'm very thorough with my pre-race prep and uh, all the things that I can look at and study and uh, very, very normal and standard kind of uh, week of prepping. Um, you know, I'd have to say that you know Texas was such an unknown that it was a very easy weekend because of the new surface to go in. I just I really didn't do much going into it because there was nothing to compare to. So that was kind of an off week of prep. But for this one, it was just kind of a normal uh, week of getting ready. We'll go to Lee and the wrap up with Dustin. Lee Spencer Motorsport.com. Congratulations, Jimmy. Thank you. Surviving Mexico. <laughs> yeah. um, I wanted to ask you what you thought about when you heard the Fernando Alonso news, and is that you know something that could be on the back burner for you one day trying to compete in the Indy 500? For me, no. My, my window is closed. Um, I was looking into it seriously years ago, um, and then Shani and I just kind of worked out a deal that um, pre-kids, sure. And I, I couldn't get it done then. So in, until uh, IndyCar decides to put some kind of roof on their cars or, or protect the driver's head, it's just, you know, from our family discussions, it's kind of out of the, it's out of the question. So, uh, but excited for, um, excited just to see what happens. As a motorsports fan, I've, I've always been a fan of Alonzo. Um, he's been very entertaining on and off the track. I love his tenacity. Um, shocked to see that uh, he's going to, you know, be able to pull it off and, and eager to see how he does. I mean, I think we all, you know, wonder how different drivers would fare in different series. And uh, I think it'll be very cool to watch. We'll finish up with Dustin. Dustin Long, NBC Sports. Throughout most of your career, the Wood Brothers were not really a, a major player in this sport. And, you know, I don't know even, even know how much you knew of them other than maybe some of the history. But as you've seen, and I understand this is a competitor, but as you've seen their strength this year, do you have a better appreciation or, or, or I don't even know if you've had contact with some of them through the years of what it's like to see that car, to see that team have some of that success considering where they were, especially throughout most of your career? Sure, that's a great question. I, I knew a little bit from afar, um, knew the David Pearson era and knew that number and paint scheme on the car, but didn't get to know them until I really started in the, the Cup Series. Um, I appreciate the history of our sport and appreciate everything they've done. 
um, but certainly not as connected as, as many others. And to see their success and to see their, uh, actually when their partnership with Penske formed, you know, I, I had a smile for them. Um, and to see their success and to see how competitive Ryan has been and to get to know, um, you know, get to know the boys over the years, they're a lot of fun. And I'm so, so happy to know that we have, you know, history still walking around in our sport. Richard Petty is still here. Um, Leonard Wood, the Wood brothers are still here. So, I mean, it, it's really cool to see it. And I, I am very happy for them. Jimmy, thanks for joining us this morning, Thank and good luck bro. this weekend. <clears throat>